Welcome everyone. I'm Aaron Maté here with Max Blumenthal, editor of The Gray Zone, and we are joined by Jeffrey Sachs. He is director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Columbia University, president of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and served as chair of the Lancet COVID-19 Commission. Jeffrey Sachs, thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. I want to get your take on the latest in uh, Ukraine. Uh, President Zelensky has just called for preemptive strikes against Russia, although a spokesperson later clarified and said he meant preventive sanctions. Uh, Biden, meanwhile, talking about uh, the world not being in the situation of facing the prospect of Armageddon since the Cuban Missile Crisis, also claiming that Putin is not joking uh, when he talks about the potential use of tactical nuclear weapons or biological or chemical weapons. Uh, that's Biden saying that, although I haven't heard Putin say any of that specifically. Meanwhile, Biden also said that the U.S. is trying to figure out an off-ramp for Putin. My question to you is, what do you make of this charge rhetoric right now? And do you think the U.S. is actually seriously interested in seeking an off-ramp at this stage? Well, uh, I take all of this very seriously because we have a, a, a war between two nuclear superpowers. So this is a, a terrible situation. This is a war between Russia and the United States. Uh, the U.S. Uh, does not have that many uh, people on the ground. We don't know who really is on the ground in Ukraine from the U.S., but a lot of weapons are finance, intelligence. This is uh, the U.S. is fighting this war, uh, and this is quite clear. And that means two sides, each that have arsenals of 1,600 or so active nuclear weapons in a war that is of tremendous significance for Russia uh, on its border. And so far where the United States is saying, we will continue to do whatever it takes to defeat Russia. Well, when you have superpowers talking in that way, you better damn take it uh, as a big threat. And I have not appreciated the US policies in this all along because I think I'm actually a little relieved in a weird way that Biden said this because I felt this all along. I felt that the US policy was on a path of escalation and that they didn't have an off ramp in their minds. By the way, there's an obvious off ramp and, and this is the whole point of this war if you really know something about it from the beginning. And the off ramp is that NATO says we're not going to enlarge to Ukraine, period. That was the off-ramp that would have prevented the war. That was the off-ramp that would have stopped this war in March when Russia and Ukraine, under the mediation of Turkey, exchanged documents and said publicly, as well as the Turkish mediators, were close to an agreement. Many of us think that the U.S. rushed in and said, oh, no, no, don't do that. You know, we don't know ever with our government what's really going on because they don't tell the truth. That just goes with the business of government the way that it's viewed in Washington. But my feeling is that there are a lot of signs that the US has been against a negotiated end to this war because my interpretation is that this issue of NATO enlargement is a deeply held objective of the United States going back to the early 1990s. It's as deeply rejected by Russia since that time. I've watched it on both sides. That's why we have a collision course that continues to escalate and why we should take damn seriously this nuclear threat, but why Biden should ask himself OK, well, good. He's asking, what's the off ramp? I'll give him the suggestion. We should never have suggested NATO enlargement to Ukraine. And we should stop now because Putin was very clear at the end of 2021. Here are my red lines and the core of them. The core of the red lines was neutrality of Ukraine. And I called the White House. Then I said, that's good. That's actually right. That's not just a concession. That is right for all sides. The White House said, yeah, we don't we don't like that. We believe Ukraine has the right to uh, join NATO. I said, 
it's, it's not a right because it impinges directly on Russia's core security perceptions. You better talk. No, no, we're not talking about that. Well, they better talk. That's, that's my bottom line. They really had better talk about this issue. By the way, uh, you can't have Zelensky negotiating with Putin. This is a war between the US and Russia. And we need to have the president of the United States and the president of Russia talking with each other and avoiding Armageddon. That's, I think, the bottom line. And Zelensky, by the way, said he wouldn't even negotiate with Russia insofar as Putin is in power. So Zelensky's taking care of that problem already, I guess. Look, you know, I, I've studied the Cuban Missile Crisis all my life, all my professional uh, adult life. I wrote a book about the aftermath of the Cuban Missile Crisis. I've looked at this issue in great detail. We came close to nuclear Armageddon exactly 60 years ago this month, by the way. And during that period, one of the provocations was Castro saying, fire, fire, telling uh, Khrushchev, you know, make a preemptive strike, just what Zelensky's doing right now. You could kind of understand it, but you know what Khrushchev said when uh, Castro said, you know, you should make a preemptive strike? Khrushchev said, my God, this is, this is supposedly our ally who would end the world. We better negotiate. We better speed up the negotiations because this is not stable. And when Zelensky says these things, I'm horrified. Uh, and yeah, they walked it back, but he, he didn't say sanctions, by the way. He said preemptive strike. And, and Zeluzny has said similar things. And they, they talk recklessly, maybe understandably, given their circumstance. I don't think so. I don't like it. And I think it shows how unstable this is. And by the way, during this whole period of this proxy war, where this is really a confrontation between Russia and the United States, we have pretended that it's a confrontation only between Russia and Ukraine, first of all. And we've said constantly, whatever Ukraine says, this is, uh, you know, that's the right thing. And so we're kind of giving carte blanche to the most extravagant, dangerous, provocative statements. And uh, another example, okay, you know, we don't know for a hundred percent, but let, let, let me uh, do, do a little quiz. Russia is in control right now of the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant. It is being shelled. We hear that's very dangerous, which it is. You shouldn't shell nuclear power plants. Now, one side controls the plant. So who is actually shelling the plant? Well, our media say, oh, we don't know who's shelling the plant. And they can't put one and one together to say, well, if Russia's in control of the plant, maybe they're not shelling their own plant. Maybe it's Ukraine shelling the plant. Well, I can tell you, I speak to a lot of people. <laughs> it's almost surely Ukraine shelling the power plant. And we can't bring ourselves to express a simple truth. And that hurts because they continue to shell the power plant with impunity. And we should say, stop shelling the power plant. Yes, it would be good if, if uh, you had control of the power plant, we can say to them, but don't shell a nuclear power plant. But we can't even find those words. That's the problem, because we're kind of faking the whole thing as if this isn't a US-Russia thing. Then we say, OK, do it. Go defeat Putin. That's great. That's what we want defeat the guy with 1,600 active nuclear warheads and several thousand more in reserve. Go ahead, go do it. As if this isn't our Armageddon that we're heading to. And that's really been a massive failure of this administration till now. One thing I've learned in, uh, I'm 67 years old, I've been through a lot of US wars, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Nicaragua, Iraq, Syria, Afghanistan, Libya, Yemen, and more. It's the job of the President of the United States to put on the brakes because this country is a war machine. 
at the top. We don't see it. We don't know it exactly. Eisenhower told us about it with the military industrial complex. This country is a war machine. The main job of the president of the United States is to stop the war machine from making wars. And we are now in an escalation heading towards Armageddon, according to the president. That's not a spectator sport. That's his job to keep us away from Armageddon. And, and Professor Sachs, you said this is a war between the US and Russia. We've heard threat after threat or call after call for an end to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland to Joe Biden himself, Senator Ron Johnson, in questioning Newland appeared to actually call for the sabotage of the pipeline. But I'm, I'm literally talking about rolling back the, the, the pipeline. And I, I loosely define that, but I mean, taking action that will prevent it from ever becoming operational. And so who do you think is responsible for the worst act of industrial sabotage in recent memory and maybe in, in long memory and what would their motive be considering that the German economy was on the hook here? <laughs> you know, I've said I, I, I wasn't there, but uh, my guess is <laughs> just like I think Ukraine is shelling the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, I think the United States blew up Nord Stream. And they told us, you know, Biden said it in February, said if Putin invades, Nord Stream is over. And then a reporter said, well, what do you mean, Mr. President? How are you going to do that? He said, we have, we have our ways. We have our ways. We, we will bring an end to it. But, do, but how, will you, how will you do that exactly, since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will, uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it. Come on. I, who controls the airspace, who monitors the airspace, who has the means to do this, who said we're going to do it, who said afterwards, this is a tremendous opportunity, this new situation, a tremendous opportunity to permanently wean Europe from Russian gas. That would be Secretary of State Blinken. Who said, thank you, USA, tweeting a picture of the burst pipeline. That would be Radek Sikorsky, former foreign minister of Poland. I, and by the way, you know, I've, uh, <laughs> I've been in touch with reporters uh, in papers that say, we don't know, or even worse, who say Russia did this. And then I talked to very senior reporters and they say, Jeff, of course, it's, it's the US, what do you think? But it doesn't get into our news. My guess is, my guess is that we're going to hear from Europe's investigators in a week or so. Hmm, very hard. We don't know. Trail went cold. Very hard to tell. We'll keep looking, but uh, we don't know. But uh, terrible blow, terrible blow. That would be consistent with the U.S. doing it. And the fact that things went a bit quiet after this, rather than parliamentarians throughout Europe demanding our core infrastructure was blown up, tells me that they're told, keep it quiet, keep it quiet. We don't really want to know exactly what happened. So I can't prove this, but it sure does, to my mind, put all the suspicion on the US side. Warnings, motive, capability, subsequent behavior, strange statements, to my mind, it adds up. I don't think Russia would blow up its core infrastructure. That doesn't make sense. And anyone else that did it would, you know, with Poland or Denmark or anyone else, that would be NATO, that would be with the US. President Joe Biden has said, Professor Sachs, that there will be an investigation into what he has deemed an act of deliberate sabotage. He said he'll send divers down, which is interesting because he knows that divers can reach it. Um, but do, do you think that this investigation will be a whitewash like the kind we saw the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons carry out where inspectors were actually censored and even attacked by OPCW leadership around the Duma Syria uh, chemical weapon attack allegations in April 2018. And what do you 
What do you make specifically of that allegation? Um, my colleague here, Aaron Mate, has done as much to expose the cover up as anyone. So it's a real issue of interest here. Well, on uh, this, uh, you know, the pipeline, the U.S. can't be the one investigating if the U.S. is uh, the most likely culprit. I mean, they, they can, but we're not going to uh, find uh, any credibility in, in what comes out of this. Uh, so I think the idea of uh, an independent and transparent investigation would, would be great, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, so uh, the U.S. may say something. Again, I'm 67 years old. It took me a long time to grow up to know that almost everything we hear is not true. We are a security state. We have a secret state, which uh, runs uh, most of our foreign and military policy, of course, and we don't hear the real thing. So I'm not putting too much stock uh, in, uh, in what the US comes up with. I'm a little more curious about what the Europeans say. It's their infrastructure after all. Uh, it's their economy, it's their uh, gas pipeline, and you would think that they might be interested in actually knowing. But what's also true is that if they do find out or they do know, which I presume they do, uh, they're not speaking also because, you know, the U.S., they think is their security umbrella. I think the U.S. is uh, the great provocation that threatens Europe uh, just about as much as anything right now. So. I don't know if we'll ever find out the truth, but frankly, there are so many issues that we never find out the truth about because we never really look. And when you have a state based on secrecy and impunity and like in Love Story, never having to say you're sorry, the CIA doesn't say, oh, we made a mistake, so sorry, let's have a careful review of what we've done. We're not going to find out about Syria. We're not going to find out about uh, this, not from the US at least. On, on Syria and the chemical weapons, I'm, I listen to you guys. I'm not enough of an expert or inside to know. But what I do know as a very basic, very basic point, the US, of course, uh, really instigated the war in Syria in 2011. It was the plan, like a hundred times before, to overthrow Assad. President uh, Obama signed a, a, a presidential finding to task the CIA to work with Saudi Arabia and others to overthrow Assad. This was Operation Timber Sycamore. What is amazing to me about the whole thing is that there's almost not been any coverage, review, explanation of this. We heard only this is a civil war. That's what we heard again and again. And then we hear even more extraordinarily, Putin intervened in Syria. Look what the Russians have done. Putin intervened years after the US took action to overthrow Russia's ally. But we can't get this story told. I think the New York Times covered Operation Sycamore one day, if I remember, something around 2016. Nothing beforehand, nothing after. And I, I knew a lot about this in those years at the time uh, because I, I knew what was happening through uh, diplomatic channels and so forth. It was like reality here, weirdness of our mainstream media here, and a narrative that was completely devoid of facts for years. And newspapers that are, of course, absolutely counter-informative. Quick uh, question on Ukraine before we move on to other topics. What do you think guides the U.S. officials who are overseeing the current policy? I mean, we had someone like Lindsey Graham recently say that as long as the U.S. arms Ukraine, they will fight to the last person. Four months into this thing, I like the structural path we're on here. As long as we help Ukraine with the weapons they need and the economic support, they will fight to the last person. Do you think that's the prevailing mentality right now? And why are they so determined to sacrifice Ukraine? in this war against Russia? 
And, and if I could piggyback on that question, Professor Sachs, since you mentioned the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and your understanding of it, uh, throughout the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Kennedy brothers, John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, were pushing back against the Joint Chiefs. Then later in Vietnam, although LBJ was going along with the Joint Chiefs, he was listening to character figures like George Ball, Assistant Secretary of State, who was an opponent of the war. Uh, do you have any insight into the thinking of the Biden administration? And is there anyone there who is resisting this drive towards nuclear escalation? Yeah, I think that the uh, core motivation of the US goes back to the neocon approach to foreign policy, which basically uh, has been the approach of the United States for 30 years now. At the end of the Soviet Union, the neocons took power, they're still in power, and their view is the US is the unipolar power, it's the sole superpower, and we're going to keep it that way. And under US strategic doctrines right now, there are two threats. Uh, Russia is one and China is the other. And it's not an accident that we're in confrontations on two fronts right now. So when it comes to Russia, Zbigniew Brzezinski pretty much spelled this out in his uh, very interesting book, uh, uh, The Global Chessboard, uh, Grand Chessboard, A Global Chessboard, 1997. Uh, where he said that uh, Ukraine is the geographical pivot of Eurasia. It's the key. Uh, if the United States is basically uh, in charge, uh, Russia ceases to be even a regional power, basically. It's uh, cut out from the Black Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean. Ukraine's a big prize if you're a neocon. Uh, if, you know, and a neocon is someone who views the world like the game of risk that you want to get all your pieces on the board and you want to take uh, all of your opponent's pieces off the board. And Ukraine is really strategic from their point of view. And this has been spelled out by Robert Kagan, for example. He's, they've written about this quite openly. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, th that family uh, is, has been part of this for the whole time because uh, Victoria Newland is the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs in the United States right now. She's been through this, through all these administrations. And so I think that this is the core, that we're gonna expand NATO. They have the idea that the North Atlantic reaches to Georgia. Now that's an interesting idea. That was uh, George Bush's uh, geographical insight in 2008. Extraordinarily cynical, but if you look at a map, what's the game plan? The game plan is control the Black Sea. It is Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia, all surrounding Russia, where their naval fleet is. So that's what Brzezinski was outlining back in 1997. Now, they thought they could kind of slip it in uh, without uh, you know, Russia being able to oppose it because they kept expanding NATO uh, step by step first the three, uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, by the way, against the promise, the clear, unequivocal promise to Gorbachev that NATO would not expand to the East. And like so many other things, the US government said, oh, we never said that. Well, they're liars. Of course they said it. And there's a full documentary record, easily accessible on the web to understand what was said. So long and the short of it is that's been the game plan for 30 years. And it's had its ups and downs because there, Ukraine itself is internally divided between East and West. And so the presidents have gone back and forth pro-Russia, anti-Russia. And when a pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, came in in 2010, after Bush had invited Ukraine into NATO, over the opposition, by the way, of European leaders, but this is a US-led alliance, Yanukovych guided neutrality through the Ukrainian parliament. That stabilized things for a little while until Yanukovych was overthrown. Overthrown by whom? Well, according to the US narrative, oh, the mass, masses on the streets. According to what I saw with my own eyes, we stirred a lot of the pot and paid for a lot of that overthrow. I don't know how much. Everything's a lie, everything's hidden. But the 
Russians say that was a coup that the US led. I can't tell you exactly the US role, but we, we heard Victoria Nuland on the tape uh, describing the formation of the new government and uh, other choice words for our European allies. And uh, I know with my own eyes, by the way, about US involvement uh, in, in that, not my involvement. I saw it. I was, oh my God, that's pretty weird what's going down. And this is Russia's point, which is, okay, you broke it again. Now, because as soon as that, as Yanukovych went down, the new government said, we want NATO. And then the US started pouring in the weapons, billions of dollars during the Trump years. Then Biden came and I thought, my God, maybe we'll get some sanity. Of course, he doubled down three times in 2021. At the highest levels, we said, Ukraine will be a member of NATO in the NATO annual meeting, in a State Department strategic document with Ukraine, and in a Defense Department strategic document. So we doubled down. That's when I called the White House at the end of the year, please take the off ramp. But they don't want to take the off ramp. Now we're close to Armageddon, we're told. There is an off ramp. We better take the off ramp. We better start talking rather than just escalating.